Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NVIDIA founder and CEO, Jensen Huang. Ohio gozaimasu. Good morning, Ohio gozaimasu. It's great to have all of you here. Wow, what a successful GTC we're having this year. Fantastic to see all of you. I have so much to share with you, I'm going to jump right in. My story today will have three chapters. The first chapter will be focused on computer graphics. The second chapter, high-performance computing and artificial intelligence. And the third chapter is the next wave of AI, autonomous machines, and robots. So let's get started. As you know, computers is the single most important instrument of society today. And yet, we have reached the end of the road of traditional computing. Moore's law that the computer industry has relied upon for 35 years has slowed down tremendously. You used to be able to rely on Moore's Law to provide 100 times performance every 10 years. 10 times performance every 5, 100 times performance every 10, and software keeps getting faster, and we're able to provide more and more capability in computers. However, because of transistor scaling, because CPUs no longer provides the level of parallelism necessary, to perform, Moore's Law has come to an end. However, there's another approach to achieve performance. We call it accelerated computing. We have been working on accelerated computing for our entire career. And over the last 15 years, we've made tremendous progress. In fact, our performance is moving and increasing at 1,000 times every 10 years, 1,000 times every 10 years. The question is, how do you achieve such incredible speed-ups? The only way to do so is to understand computer science from architecture to applications and everything in between. And we have to optimize the entire stack. NVIDIA is a computing company. We're one of the few computer companies in the world that operates, optimizes, and engineers at every single layer of the computer. We call it full stack optimization. As a result, we've been able to achieve tremendous results. Our company is organized, and we focus on developing this entire stack. One architecture applied to solving the greatest challenges in computing. We start of course, with great architecture and chips. We build three types of chips today. A GPU, an SOC with GPUs and other accelerators, and then the MV switch, a link we call the MV link that connects multiple processors together for very high performance. Those chips go into our systems. We have three types of systems. The first system is called GTX and the new RTX. These are essentially supercomputers in a little tiny package. Extraordinary levels of engineering, and it goes into your PC and workstation, and it turns it into a supercomputer. The second type of system we call DGX. The NVIDIA DGX is engineered for high-performance computing and AI fully engineered systems that we also use as reference designs for computer makers all over the world. The motherboard inside is called the HGX for hyperscale graphics. HGX is available in almost every single cloud in the world and every single computer maker in the world. And there's one new computer system I want to reveal today. I'm very excited about that. The processors, the fundamental interconnects, the systems, 
are only powerful with the entire acceleration stack. One of the most important things we do as a company is the acceleration stack. The system software, all of the libraries, computational libraries, and the domain-specific acceleration that we deliver in order to make each and every application run faster than Moore's law would have predicted. Essentially, we have to optimize one application domain at a time. And the number of application domains in computer science today, as you know, is tremendous. These stacks are integrated into self-contained packages. These packages are called containers, Docker containers. From the NVIDIA Docker, the middleware and all of the SDKs inside, all containerized per application and put into the NVIDIA GPU cloud. We call it the NGC. The NGC is a registry of all of these wonderfully packaged and optimized and tuned and tested software packages. The entire layer, the entire stack, is containerized and put into the NGC cloud. NGC is a registry. You download the container into all of your computers anywhere, whether it's in a cloud or in your data center or by your desk side, you now have a fully optimized acceleration stack. As I mentioned, we have to think about one domain at a time. Moore's law stopped, and it will not continue, not because the world doesn't have good engineers. The world has amazing engineers. Moore's law stopped because transistor scaling, the laws of physics, no longer allows it. So the only way that we could overcome Moore's law is to think about one application at a time and to use the ingenuity of computer science, one domain at a time, to boost the performance beyond what was reasonably possible using transistors alone. We focus on eight vertical markets. The gaming market is one of the world's largest technology industries. It is the driving force of our GPU. It is the reason why our GPU technology has innovated so fast over so many years. Because the market is gigantic. And eventually, everyone will be a gamer. Professional visualization, high-performance computing, otherwise known as supercomputing, artificial intelligence, transportation, which is going through a tremendous revolution right now, robotics, which is about to emerge, healthcare, one of the most important industries in the world, and AI at the edge, autonomous machines in general. These vertical markets, I can't talk about all of them today, but I will touch on some very important ones, and we will announce new products and new platforms that will help us grow and reinvent each one of these markets. The first dynamic is the end of Moore's Law and the emergence of a new computing model we call accelerated computing. The second dynamic is artificial intelligence. This happened as a result of the fact that several researchers around the world discovered NVIDIA GPUs would allow them to train very large neural networks with large amounts of data. Neural networks, as you know, has been in development for many, many years. However, because the neural networks were all very shallow or small, it was very difficult to overcome software engineers' capabilities. In order to create these large neural networks that can achieve magical results, an enormous amount of data had to be trained on the network. Otherwise, the network would be what is called overfit. It would simply learn very few things. If we want to allow artificial intelligence to learn many things and be very diverse in all kinds of conditions, we have to have very large networks, and we have to train it with enormous amounts of data. Well, researchers about seven, eight years ago discovered that NVIDIA GPUs were incredible at processing deep neural networks. Working with us, we were able to take their neural networks and accelerate it so that Training times, developing these neural networks, reduced from weeks down to days. It made all the difference. As a result, great breakthroughs has happened in deep learning. 
data is used to train a skeleton of a model, of a deep learning model, using supercomputers, we can now write magic software. This is going to change everything in software development. This has changed everything at NVIDIA. The way we do software today no longer allows for just an engineer to engineer their own software, but an engineer plus a supercomputer working together to write magic software. This is the way software will be created in the future. Every software company, every company that develops software will have supercomputers that augment, that work side by side with their engineers to create magic software. And the software is amazing. This is a piece of work from UC Berkeley. And um, Dr. Afros uh, was able to teach a neural network how to look at a black and white image and colorize it. This is a piece of work from NVIDIA where we taught a conditional GAN, a neural network that can imagine, not just recognize and classify, but a neural network that can imagine. And we gave it, we taught it how to take a segmentation map, this monochrome image, and imagine what a city would be like. This next one is done by L'Oreal. They taught a neural network how to recognize and track hair and colorize the hair. That's just incredible. The first time I showed that to someone, they thought they were twins. This one is really cool. This is done by the University of Hong Kong, literally with hand sketches. From hand sketches, you could go to a 3D model. You could teach a neural network to not only recognize and classify, but you could teach a neural network how to generate. Well, these two fundamental dynamics, the end of Moore's law and the emergence of artificial intelligence, where software writes software, where software development is a supercomputing problem. These two dynamics, these two dynamics has caused NVIDIA's approach of computing to completely skyrocket. In the last five years, the attendees of GTC has increased by a factor of seven. The number of developers has increased by a factor of five. We have now over a million developers. This computing approach is now in almost every field of science. You know that coming up with a new computing approach and a new computing model doesn't happen very easily. In fact, the PC was in the 90s. Mobile in the year 2000. Cloud computing 10 years after that. Every 10 or 15 years, a new computing model emerges, and it lasts for decades. The reason why it takes so long for computing models to approach, to emerge, is because software developers need to know that that computing model will be around for decades. They need to know that the reach of the new computing model is great so that their software could reach many people. And they need to know that this computing approach can continue to deliver great benefits to their software for decades to come. Well, we've reached that tipping point in one field after another, whether it's in ray tracing or deep learning or healthcare, informatics, medical imaging, computational structural dynamics, computational fluid dynamics, computational chemistry, the number of fields that now takes advantage of NVIDIA GPU accelerated computing is literally pervasive. So much so that this year, 54% of the new computing horsepower in the world's top 500 supercomputers came from one architecture, NVIDIA's GPUs. 54% of the new computing flops. We now power five of the world's top seven supercomputers. There's no question now that NVIDIA GPU computing has reached a tipping point. One of the most computationally intensive applications, and one of the reasons why 
computer graphics has propelled high-performance computing over the years is because recreating virtual reality and simulating light physics is hard. Simulating light physics so that this world looks as it should to all of us inside a computer. Creating virtual reality is computationally immense. It has been the holy grail of computer graphics to be able to do this technique called ray tracing. It was pioneered, it was described for the very first time by Turner Whitted. He's now a researcher at NVIDIA in 1979. He described a method where you would trace a beam of light backwards into the screen and it would reflect and would refract from a surface as it reaches, as it traces its way back to another point of illumination or the light. This method of iteratively ray tracing a light was called ray tracing. It was elegant, it produced wonderful results, but it was computationally intense. Today's approach for computer graphics uses rasterization. Basically, we take the geometry of the 3D world, the 3D world geometry, and we project using linear algebra into the 2D world plane. Ray tracing is the other way. You start from a light beam from the eyes and you shoot it through the display and you trace it to the source of the light. Rasterization was incredibly efficient because all of the pixels are in a line after the projection to the screen. Ray tracing was incredibly hard. However, Rasterization was very difficult, very efficient to construct the 3D world, but very difficult for complex lighting conditions. This room is a complex lighting condition. In fact, the only direct lighting is on me, yet all of you are lit. So the light is bouncing everywhere, and it's just picking up a little bit of yourself in the room. Ray tracing has the ability to produce photorealistic renders. Images that look like a photograph, but it's computationally so incredibly intensive. Well, after 10 years, after 10 years of working on this problem, we were able to discover a new method for accelerating ray tracing. And this year at SIGGRAPH, we announced the biggest, the biggest jump in computer graphics in the last 10 years. The ability to fuse a hybrid technique, rasterization plus ray tracing plus artificial intelligence. Combining the three technologies, we were able to produce real-time ray tracing for the very first time. And the first product to benefit from that was announced at SIGGRAPH this year, and it's the Quadro RTX. Quadro RTX is a brand new generation. That's why we called it RTX instead of GTX. RTX is a brand new generation of GPUs. The biggest leap in 10 years. It uses this hybrid rendering technology. There are three different versions that we showed, starting from $2,300 all the way to a $10,000 Quadro RTX 8000 which has the ability to shoot 10 billion rays, 10 giga rays per second into the screen, generating beautiful images. Quadro RTX 8000 also has the ability to combine multiple GPUs to create gigantic frame buffers. And the reason why that's so important is when you're creating a photorealistic world, the amount of asset, digital asset that you have to create is very, very large. And so the frame buffer size has to be gigantic. Using our MVLink technology, where the GPUs could read and see each other's memories as its own, we were able to take two RTX 8000s to create a 96 gigabyte frame buffer for the very first time. The biggest shipping today is only 32 gigabyte that is used for our supercomputers. 96 gigabyte frame buffered. Now we can render almost anything in photoreal. 
Quadro RTX is going to enable us to go into some really exciting new markets. For the very first time, for the very first time, Quadro RTX, our GPUs, will be able to accelerate what otherwise was done previously in CPU farms. Large data centers of CPUs are crunching slowly one pixel and one ray at a time to generate the photorealistic image. This has now been replaced with one of these RTX servers. This is one of the RTX servers right here. Hey, Paul, could I get a... Guys, this is what Quadro RTX looks like. Isn't that beautiful? The world's first ray tracing GPU should also be reflective. That's why it's made of chrome. Pretty amazing. Eight of these, eight of these go into this new class of server we call the RTX rendering server. There are eight of them inside. These eight, these eight will produce, will generate 80 billion rays per second. 80 billion rays per second. As a result, we could ray trace and photorealistic render 60 times faster than a CPU server. 60 times. So basically, entire racks, two racks of servers will be replaced by just one Quadro RTX server. Incredible, incredible performance. The benefits for the artist, of course, is to be able to create shots much, much more quickly. And in the case of IT departments, they can save more money. Because as you know, come on, you know. <laughs> Somebody help me out. What do you know? The more you buy, the more you save. That's right. OK. Just, <laughs> just as it was for high performance computing, it is now true for photorealistic rendering. An entire data center could now be replaced with one beautiful server. The adoption, the excitement from the industry has been incredible. From Adobe to Disney Pixar to Weta, some of the most amazing and the most important rendering and uh, digital content creation houses in the world have adopted this architecture and racing to port their application onto the RTX. And the results are just fantastic. These markets are going to, for the first time, enjoy GPU accelerated workloads for the very first time. $200 billion, $250 billion industry, film and TV, catalog and product design, catalog rendering, architecture engineering, the number of industries that will be reshaped as a result of this new capability is really, really exciting. This is a brand new market for GPUs, and for the very first time, we can generate photorealistic rendering images and accelerate data centers. Our second Turing generation our second RTX is the GeForce. This is the product, GeForce is the product that made NVIDIA famous. And this is the brand new NVIDIA GeForce RTX. It's just beautiful. This engineering is exquisite. As I mentioned, this is essentially a supercomputer on just one card, one little box. Inside this little box, inside this GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. Uh, so first of all, the RTX family starts at 499 with the RTX 2070, and it goes all the way up to this amazing beast of a GPU. 14 teraflops of 32-bit floating, floating point performance. The first time ever, an independent integer operations pipeline with 14 trillion integer operations per second. And for the very first time on GeForce, our Tensor Core GPUs. 
the Tensor Core GPUs that are used for artificial intelligence is now available on GeForce, and the results are completely exciting. You could imagine the new revolution in computer graphics, where artificial intelligence and computer graphics will merge in the new type of neural graphics processing approach. We're super excited about the results. Can't wait to show it to you. 114 tensor flops and 10 giga rays per second of ray tracing. The results are really quite amazing. First of all, this is the new performance king. Thank you. This is the new performance king. Every single generation, we take a step forward in capability. Every single generation, we want to reach a level of computer graphics capability that makes the experience tremendously better. In the case of the 980 generation, the GTX 980 and the GTX 980 Ti were the first GPUs in the world to render 1080p with full resolution, with full um, graphics capabilities, all of the special effects, at 60 frames per second. The GTX 1080 was the first GPU in the world to achieve 60 hertz for 1440p. So 1K, 2K, and now with the 2080 generation, for the very first time, we could achieve 4K gaming at 60 frames per second. Just really, really exciting. The fastest GPU in the world, all running at 4K. But that's not all, that's just the beginning. By, re by creating this new approach to computer graphics, where computer shaders, computer graphics shaders, and tensor cores of 114 teraflops are working together to generate images, we're able to boost the frame rate tremendously. The reviews are going to come soon. And you're going to see some amazing results. And so the performance is going to be quite incredible. And it's made possible by taking computer graphics and artificial intelligence and merging it together into a new approach. So 14 teraflops of shader performance with 114 tera tensor flow ops, tensor, tensor ops, combined together, working together, deliver amazing results. And then lastly, ray tracing. For the very first time, it is now possible for you to see beautiful reflections and shadows, and it looks right. You know, usually when you look at a computer graphics game, you know something is not quite right. It's beautiful, it's fun, but it's not quite right. For the very first time, we're able to do ray tracing. As a result, reflections are just right. Shadows are just right, and they look realistically and beautiful. Our goal, our goal is to be able to generate images that look like photographs. In order to do so, several things has to happen. The reflection has to look right. The way that shadows are casted, the way that soft shadows emerge as a result of what is called area lights for people who are in computer graphics or large lights, those shadows are soft and beautiful and very difficult for today's traditional computer graphics to generate. We model that area light with a whole bunch of spotlights, a big area of those spotlights. And the approach, although, although can generate convincing images, don't look right. This is, looks like a photograph. In order to make this happen, so many things in computer graphics had to change. One of them is ray tracing. What you see here, of course, is light that bounced off this wall and is now illuminated on this white surface. Not, not only is the light coming from the top, light is coming from everywhere, otherwise known as global illumination. Well, what you're looking at is not a photograph. <coughs> Sean? Let's show them this is not a photograph. Let's swap in some different objects here. That's a beautiful graphics card. 
We can move objects around, all the reflections simply. When you work. move the objects, the reflections change. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the, the reflections just simply work. Uh, even as we change materials in, in our object, if we want it slightly less reflective, the behavior is simply perfect. There are two, te two techniques that today's traditional computer graphics uses for reflections. One is called environmental probes, environment reflection probes. They basically generate an image of the environment and use it to uh, use as a texture lookup. And the second is screen space. We no longer have to do that. We use ray tracing. Uh, and to really show off what we can do using ray tracing for global illumination, we've, we've disabled some of the, the GI, and we just know instantly that this just doesn't look correct. This uh, is one bounce, one bounce ray tracing. And once we enable the fully uh, global illuminated image, we get all of the ambience, all of the color cast. You see the green shows up on the ball. Sean, keep going. And we can crank it up to 11 by having the, the light source directly illuminate those colors. Everything in the environment becomes a light source. Refractions just work. Look, light is going through that glass jar and is being bent as it travels through the light, the, to the, through the glass jar. Reflections just work, even in motion. It's so amazing that when you simulate the physics of light, things just work. The mirrors just work. Reflections just work. Caustics just work. And look at the beautiful soft shadows. And the shadows are coming from everywhere, including all the little spotlights that are going around. This is just really amazing. So what I'm going to do now is to take all of this technology and put it together into one demo to share with you. What you're about to see, what you're about to see, beautiful shadows, incredible reflections, reflections on reflections. The reflections are dynamic. Everything is running in real time. Let's show it to them. <laughs> Everything you saw was completely in real time. The reflections, the reflections of reflections, otherwise known as inner reflections. All the beautiful shadows. Everything is now generated in real time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the way video games will look in the future. 
it's completely lifelike, completely different than anything we see today. And frankly, it is so much easier to create. And the reason for that is because the lights just behave as lights. The different tricks necessary to create those special effects have tremendous re tremendously reduced. The RTX generation, the biggest leap in computer graphics in the last 10 years is going to reinvent computer graphics. This new hybrid approach of using rasterization plus ray tracing plus artificial intelligence deep learning, neural graphics. These three techniques are going to come together as a hybrid rendering approach that we called RTX, and it is going to completely reinvent computer graphics, the NVIDIA RTX. I'm going to change now and talk about artificial intelligence and high-performance computing. This is the NVIDIA DGX2. It's completely new. We announced it recently. We'll be shipping it this quarter. This is the largest single node computer the world has ever created. This system was designed for artificial intelligence, high performance computing, and big data analytics. These application are, applications are some of the most important applications that we know today. And we felt that it deserves a special, completely from the ground up architecture created for it. This one node has two petaflops. It basically replaces, it basically replaces, oh, something like um, a, a few thousand GPUs, a few thousand CPUs. An entire data center can be reduced into one DGX2 node in the application of artificial intelligence and, deep, uh, and uh, high performance computing. Two petaflops. What makes it really special is these 16 GPUs are connected by a brand new interconnect called the NVLink2. As a result, every GPU can see the memory and can read and write to that memory with very low overhead as if it's their own memory. 16 GPUs are now sharing 512 gigabytes of memory. 16 GPUs, two petaflops, 512 gigabytes of memory. And the amazing thing is the aggregate bandwidth to that memory is 16 terabytes per second. 16 terabytes per second is effectively 400 CPUs memory bandwidth together. That's just an incredible amount of bandwidth and compute and memory in one single operating system node. One single node. DGX2 is going to change how computing is done for so many different applications. It is our system. It's right here. This is the DGX2. It is uh, 190 or 160 kilograms. So I won't try to lift it. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is quite, quite remarkable. Uh, this is the motherboard. This is the motherboard. Uh, hi. <laughs> Michael Jackson can't do this. Okay. This is the motherboard. It is very, very dense. It is the most densely populated motherboard the world has ever seen, and heavy. And there's eight GPUs. Two motherboards are connected in the backplane through NVLink. Every single, these are all the NVLink switches and certies. And as a result, every single GPU can talk to every other GPU, and every single GPU can see the memory of all the other GPUs all at the same time. An incredible computer. This HGX2 is also the motherboard that goes into data centers, and it's a reference design for all of our system partners. Okay. <laughs> uh, my sand. <laughs> that 
what was my workout today? <laughs> I'm happy we're also in the software business. The NVIDIA DGX2. And so, so, so in, order, in order to achieve the highest level of performance for artificial intelligence, of course you have to make the right processors. You also have to make the right systems, and the right system interconnect, and that all of the software that makes it possible to work together. The fast math kernels, the integration into all of the frameworks in the world, and there are so many frameworks. There's TensorFlow, there's Chainer here in Japan, an excellent framework. There's uh, PyTorch, there's Cafe2, there are more coming. There are frameworks that are optimized for research. There are frameworks that are better for reinforcement learning. All kinds of different types of frameworks uh, in the world. We have to work with all of the researchers to integrate all of this technology into it. As a result, the performance is utterly amazing. These are all of the fastest training, neural network training times. What otherwise would have been weeks can now come down to a day or a few hours. These are the fastest training times in the world. You could train the ResNet 50, the ResNet 50 in 24 hours. The ResNet 50 on 24 hours in one single chip. This is the fastest one chip performance in the world. Just to put it in perspective, just 18 months ago, just 18 months ago, it was 10 times longer. Just 18 months ago, it was 10 times longer. In order to train, to basically compile one software, an engineer would have to wait 240 hours. Incredible on one node. Or they would have to wait uh, 1,000 minutes 1,000 minutes on the fastest node. Incredible amounts of time. And yet, seven years ago, it was another 500 times slower. And so we are moving at incredible rates. And that's only possible by changing the architecture of the GPUs, the interconnects, the systems, the system software, all of the libraries, and the optimization necessary to accelerate the frameworks. You ask your, and so this is for images, and this is for, these are CNNs, and these are RNNs. And the RNNs are more complicated to train because every current state and next state depends on all of the previous states, okay? And so in order to do translation of language from Chinese to Japanese or, or English to German or whatever it is, you have to train on a large sequence of letters, map them into words, and translate them into the alternative uh, language. Training time is incredibly important. You ask yourself, now that we're at 24 hours, it seems okay. When we're at 108 minutes, it seems okay. And when you can put it onto a heart, a, a, as many s server nodes as you want, you could train it in six and a half minutes. That seems okay. However, in fact, it's not at all. And the reason for that is in order, to do hyper, in order to do artificial intelligence, you have to try so many different experiments. This is just one experiment. Each and every single day, our engineers at NVIDIA try thousands of experiments. And they have to try it thousands and thousands of times. And in the future, we will have artificial intelligence write artificial intelligence. And so these, there will be an AI on top of these networks using reinforcement learning techniques to search for the best AI, the best AI model and the best AI settings, the best model settings to achieve the results. And so it turns out that we are far from good enough and we have to keep improving the performance and the number of systems that we have to use to train our networks, it still remains basically supercomputing scale. Well, here in Japan, uh, we're doing just incredible work in high performance computing and AI. In fact, you may know that Japan was where the world's first NVIDIA supercomputer was built. 
The very first GPU supercomputer was called the Subame. The Subame was built here in Japan by pioneering researchers who realized the benefits of GPU acceleration. Today, we're doing so incredible work here in Japan. Uh, the uh, ABCI supercomputer, AI supercomputer, is 550 petaflops. 550 petaflops. It's basically equivalent to 1 million CPUs. Imagine 1 million CPUs. It would take this entire room and more to replace what otherwise is 550 petaflops, the fastest artificial intelligence supercomputer here in Japan. Fujifilm is building a supercomputer for medical imaging. Weather News, the number one weather prediction service in the world, is using artificial intelligence trained on NVIDIA's DGX, partnering with a company called Di Diagnosis, a smart AI, uh, AI startup that's really, really, really clever, using satellite images to detect where there will be precipitation, where there will be rain. The problem is very simple. The world doesn't have enough cloud penetrating radars all over the ground, but there's plenty of satellite images. And so instead of the cost, the $80 billion of investment necessary to put radars everywhere in the world, we can now use satellites and we could early detect troublesome weather in regions of the world that simply are not covered by radar. Okay, so the results are really fantastic. NTT is creating a large supercomputer with NVIDIA GPUs so that their researchers could develop AI for communications, 5G communications, fraud detection, emotion detection, incredible work that's being done there. And PFN, this is the, the, uh, the AI startup I mentioned earlier, the creator of the Chainer framework has a large data center supercomputer of NVIDIA V1000, V100s, and uh, they use it to achieve some of the world records that they've achieved in AI. Really fantastic work here in Japan. Thank you very much. That's, that's Taiwan. I, the, it looks safe, it looks okay. <laughs> Everything's fine. That's where our fab is, so I'm, I'm happy to see that. <clears throat> so that's for high performance computing and AI training. Training these models. Training these models are supercomputing problems. Training these models requires supercomputers to iterate over and over and over again as it tries to discover the knowledge and build up this hierarchical knowledge tree that turns it into an AI. When you're done with this model, this model is a large computational graph. This large computational graph has millions of mathematics parameters inside, and it does linear algebra. And this linear algebra turns, it creates software that no humans could write. And it's a gigantic program. No humans could write it, and no human could read it and understand it. It's so big. Well, it takes a supercomputer to run it. In training, it takes trillions of iterations to train one model. When that model is complete, Billions of people will use it. That model sits in a hyperscale data center. That hyperscale data center has today 10 to 20 to 30 million processors all running microservices. Every single time you use your mobile device, search for something, talk to the web, talk to the net, every time that happens, a small microservice that runs on this neural network happens. And their job is to deliver that neural network performance as low latency as possible so that your quality of service is good. And also to enable the data center to have high throughput so their capital cost could be low. They want the low latency for quality of service. They want the high throughput so that they ca their capital cost could be lower 
and they could support more customers as a result. Last year, we announced a new GPU dedicated for inference. After you're done training the model on NVIDIA GPUs, you could run it on NVIDIA GPUs. It doesn't matter what kind of model. There are thousands of different types of models being created. It doesn't matter. If you create it on NVIDIA GPU, of course, it will run on NVIDIA GPU. We call it the Tesla P4, the P4. 75 watts, sits in a hyperscale data center, and it runs these neural networks at high throughput and low latency. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we're announcing a brand new hyperscale GPU. Look at this thing. Look how cute it is. Ladies and gentlemen, the Tesla T4. The brand new hyperscale GPU. It is a universal inference accelerator. It fits into any hyperscale server from 1U to 4U. It only consumes 75 watts, and so it fits anywhere. Plugs into a PCI Express. There's some very new things with the Tesla T4. It's based on the Turing architecture. The Turing architecture that I just described that will revolutionize computer graphics, Quadro RTX and GeForce RTX. I believe it will completely revolutionize how AI is deployed in data centers. The Tesla T4 has a brand new Tensor Core GPU inside. The Tensor Core GPU the Tensor Core GPU is a reinvention of our GPU. If you look at Pascal, this is our previous architecture, the architecture that became enormously successful in artificial intelligence. And the reason for that is because we are able to process, because we're naturally good at linear algebra. Linear algebra is the foundation of 3D to two-dimensional transformation that I mentioned earlier. Pascal was so good that it revolutionized and made popular deep learning. We realized that we could do so much more. And we realized the impact and the importance of deep learning to every field of science. Whether it's, of course, artificial intelligence, neural services in the cloud, we believe that it will even revolutionize how science is done and how computer graphics is done. And so we decided to reinvent the GPU altogether. And the Tensor Core is amazing. This is what a Tensor Core looks like. So Pascal, whatever Pascal does, the Turing FP16 does eight times faster. But we didn't stop there. Turing now has mixed precision with N8 Tensor Core at 16x the throughput, and we didn't stop there. Turing now has a tensor core with mixed precision that includes 4-bit integer that is operated concurrently at the full limits of the data path and accumulated in 32-bit integer. So 4-bit integer operating in parallel, accumulated at 32-bit integer, and this is what that looks like. Wow, look at the progress in just one architecture generation. As a result, we're able to deliver 65 teraflops of FP16, 132 tops of N8, and 260 trillion operations of 4-bit integer so that we could combine, mix and match them, mix and match these precision to maximize accuracy, maximize accuracy and throughput. By, max, by creating an architecture that can mix and match all of these mixed precisions, we could maximize precision as well as arc accuracy as well as throughput, all at 75 watts. Now, when you compare that to the Tesla P4 that we shipped last year, this is what that looks like. The Pascal 
P4. This is based on Pascal. This is based on Turing. The difference is extraordinary. In just one year, what a giant leap in performance. And so that's the Turing T4 Universal Inference Accelerator. The processor is just the first step. One of the things that we do at NVIDIA, as I mentioned before, is that we architect and design software and hardware at the same time. And as I mentioned earlier, what comes out of these frameworks are large computational graphs, so large that no optimizing compiler has ever seen anything like it. And so we created a brand new type of optimizing compiler we call TensorRT. TensorRT analyzes the entire computational graph, figure, figures out what kind of layers each one of them are, fusing it vertically, fusing it horizontally, and has the ability to optimize the memory reads and writes so that the architecture is taken advantage of at its full potential. TensorRT was one of the best things we've ever done. And it's that we've discovered it's also one of the hardest things we have ever done. TensorRT, in combination with our new GPU, delivers amazing results. This is what happens with TensorRT. This is the brand new generation we call TensorRT5. TensorRT5 has the ability to do CNNs and RNNs, multi-layer perceptrons, neural collaborative filtering used for recommendation systems. So whether it's speech recognition, image recognition, recommendation search, or speech synthesis, the results are absolutely remarkable. Huge step ups over what they can do, what, they, what hyperscale data centers can do in CPUs alone. Huge step up. Well, in just the one year's time that we've announced the Tesla P4 and the Tensor RT, we've had over 12,000 developers, artificial intelligence developers, download Tensor RT in just one year in over 4,000 companies. There is no question that deep learning is being deployed throughout the world. It is now included in hyperscale data centers around the world, and we're seeing incredible growth here in just one year. People are using it for video analytics, real-time live video, because it's so important to make sure that harmful video doesn't reach the public. Speech recognition, you know that almost everything we do requires talking to your phone these days. And the type of services that we'll see in the future are gonna be amazing. You'll be able to talk to your computer, talk to the phone, talk to the cloud, talk to that service as if it's a human. Speech requires very low latency. And when billions of people are using it at the same time, you need low latency and you need high throughput. Otherwise, these data centers simply cannot sustain it. So video analytics, speech, search, natural language processing, images, maps, the number of applications, and this is just a few. The number of applications that are now taking advantage of deep learning is just growing exponentially. And so these hyperscale data centers cannot just run one thing, it has to run everything. Every one of these applications has to run, and that's one of the reasons why the universal nature, the universal architecture of the Tesla P4 is so powerful. The demand in the marketplace is great, and all of our system makers, partners, recognize it. So there's so many different versions being built. And one of the versions that is being built is the Quanta Grid, Quanta Grid 4U with 16 Tesla T4s. In just one node, we will see one petaflops, one petaflops of floating point inference performance one petaflops of floating point inference performance. Let's take a look at what that means. When you have something that is this dense in just one 4U computer, this is what it looks like. Well, this is what a traditional server looks like. And suppose we had a 200 CPU server, a 200 CPU server, that's what it looks like, four, five racks, five racks, 60,000 watts five racks and 60,000 watts, and you could use it to run these networks that we, uh, type of services that you would expect. 
And this is what it looks like with the new Tesla T4. You see that? Um, this is uh, empty. <laughs> it's just there. You, you see this? So expensive. You see this? So, 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 so cheap. <laughs> the... The more you buy, the more you save. Jensen's law. <laughs> the more you buy, the more you save. It's like going to Costco. The more you buy, the more you save. <clears throat> and so here's, the, here's a problem, though. So what's the catch? It turns out that the adoption is going fantastically, but it can go even faster. There's a challenge with this. The challenge is the number of models and frameworks, the model type and the framework type that we can run concurrently on a GPU is one. We can only run one model type and one framework type at one time on one GPU. That was the state of the art of Kubernetes on NVIDIA GPU, Docker on NVIDIA GPU, and all of our software with TensorRT 4.0. Even though the throughput is incredible, even though the throughput is incredible, the utilization is not high. So if you need the throughput, if you need the fast latency, then, of course, you will use these GPUs. However, if you're designing a data center that can run any application inside it, and you want the utility to be high, then this can be a limiter. Well, we've realized this for some time, and so we've been working on this new software stack. And this new software stack is just utterly incredible. I am so excited about this. We call it the TensorRT hyperscale, the TensorRT hyperscale. Basically, it works like this. This, for many of you, uh, it's a container. There are containers inside. Each one of those colored cubes are different models, different models. One could be a CNN, one could be an RNN, one could be an MLP, one could be an NCF, okay? There are all kinds of different models that could be running inside a container, and those containers are running inside a pod, a Kubernetes pod. And this is the Kubernetes infrastructure. Kubernetes is the single most important large-scale, hyperscale orchestration infrastructure today. Hyperscale is simply impossible without something like Kubernetes. And Kubernetes adoption is all over the world. Kubernetes is really fantastic. Kubernetes is now on NVIDIA GPUs that we announced last year. The other really important infrastructure of hyperscale is Docker. And we also have mentioned that because of Docker, we were able to create the NVIDIA GPU cloud. However, inside each one of these containers, there can only be one model. Well, today we're announcing our TensorRT hyperscale. And it basically has four characteristics. The first is Kubernetes and Docker on NVIDIA GPU has been enhanced for multi-model capability. We now have a new inference engine. The new inference engine sits inside one of the containers in the pod. It's a separate container. And this separate container will orchestrate and manage the many other containers running multiple models each on NVIDIA GPUs and run it on one node. And so now we could have, with this inference serving engine, the ability to run multiple model types and frameworks concurrently. All those different model types and all those different frameworks that we support can now run inside this container, inside this pod, on one node at one time. As a result, the throughput of your data center continues to be really, really excellent because our GPUs are so fast. But more importantly now, 
the utilization, the utility and the utilization, the usefulness and the utilization also goes way up. Also goes way up. This is what is the different layers are. The NVIDIA Docker inside the, makes containers possible. The NVIDIA Deep Learning SDK, all of our libraries and technologies and acceleration software stacks, all of the different DNN models that came out of training and optimized by TensorRT, and the brand new TensorRT inference server all sits inside this pod, sits on top of Kubernetes, and as a result, you could deploy any service with these models anywhere in a data center, wherever there's a GPU. It's just utterly incredible. This is, this is one of the most important new software investments that we've made, and I'm super happy to share this with you. The TensorRT hyperscale looks like this. Now your data center, instead of only one color cube, so instead of only one color cube on one node, we can now have all different colors of cubes, all different types of uh, neural network models with different frameworks running on one node concurrently. You could have large pods, you could have smaller pods, you could have big containers and small containers. It doesn't matter. You develop your microservice, you kick it off in Kubernetes, Kubernetes fires up a server, lets you know that the server is ready for you. It starts up and creates the pod and the containers, and then the services can run. All right. Imagine, imagine it's running. In one situation, only one model can run on each node. Although the throughput is high, the utilization on the data center is low because the different types of services coming in is very dynamic. It's changing all the time. If this server can only run CNN, and this can only run RNN, and this one can only run MLP, and this one can only run NCF, then when the workload demand changes, it is impossible to keep all of them busy at the same time. However, if each node, as a result of TensorRT hyperscale, can run any model at the same time, then the utilization of this server will be maximum. The difference is a utilization of maybe 20-something percent to a utilization of something like 90 percent. And so as a result of this one single piece of software, the utilization of a data center can increase by many times, by many times, one single piece of software in order to orchestrate and simultaneously run multiple models on one GPU. All of the software is completely free. It's incredible. And it's not even very heavy. That was a joke. Okay. We'll show you later. And so our inference performance is incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, the NVIDIA TensorRT Hyperscale, the brand new Tesla T4 Universal Inference Accelerator in combination with the multi-precision Tensor Core that is 12 times the floating point performance of the last generation, the new TensorRT 5.0 that is optimized for Tensor Cores, and the performance are incredible, and you add that with all of the Kubernetes and Docker enhancement and the brand new TensorRT inference server. Together, this is our inference platform. As you could see, in order to leap above Moore's law, you cannot just build a chip. It is not possible to just build a chip. If it was possible to build a chip, many people would have just built a chip. You have to think about the entire software stack. You have to think about the workload. Talking about chips, one of the most important chips NVIDIA has ever made is something that has just gone into production, and I'm so excited about it. We architected and started dreaming about this chip five years ago. Five years ago. And then 8,000 engineering years later, ladies and gentlemen, the Xavier. 
Xavier is the first of its kind. Xavier, there's so much technology inside, but let me explain it simply. Xavier is designed to put artificial intelligence and high-performance computing at the edge, inside autonomous machines, inside autonomous machines, so that these machines in the future can be intelligent. It could be an intelligent car that drives by itself. It could be an in intelligent shuttle. It could be an intelligent lawnmower. It can be an intelligent truck. It can be an intelligent robot for manufacturing. Warehouse robots to help you lift heavy things. In the future, there might even be a robot here to help me carry the HGX2. And we can bring the DGX on stage. In the future, these robots, these autonomous machines, need a new type of brain. That brain we call Xavier. That brain requires to do several things. First of all, it has to have very high bandwidth, CERTES capability, I.O. capability. Xavier has 109 gigabits per second of input CERTES, 320 gigabits per second of bidirectional CERTES, or 640 gigabits per second. In one chip, almost one terabits per second of CERTES. No chip has ever had this much I.O. And the reason for that is this. We need to support multiple cameras, multiple LIDARs, multiple radars. We want to create a chip that has the ability to scale from one to two to four. And so the ability to interconnect and reassemble these systems is vitally important. Number one, very high-speed high speed I.O. Number two, sensor processing. We could sensor process from images. The ISP is incredible. The ISP is utterly incredible. 10 trillion operations per second. It does image processing, tone mapping, high dynamic range natively, has the ability to warp images and de-warp images, all of the different types of image processing capabilities inside one ISP. There's a SOFA, Stereo Optical Flow Accelerator, that has the ability to look at stereo cameras and infer from it the motion around it. It has a PVA, a Programmable Vision Accelerator, for traditional computer vision architectures and algorithms that we still want to use. It has a DLA for Deep Learning Accelerator. It has a brand new GPU with the Tensor Core architecture inside. And it has eight ARM64 high-performance CPUs. All of this is packed into one thing. And the reason for that is this. All of these autonomous machines share something in common. They have to take the input from all the sensors. They have to figure out what the sensor says. It ha they have to sensor process. They have to figure out the perception, what is happening around the world. They have to reason about it using software, and they have to plan their action. Sensors, perception, reasoning and planning, that loop is the robotics computation loop. The robotics computation loop was the reason why we built Xavier. And the robotics computation loop is intensely complicated. And so Xavier, the world's first processor for autonomous machines. It is, com it is in production today, and because of this technology, we're able to bring and create a new line of computers. I'm so excited to announce a brand new line of new computers from M NVIDIA. It's called the NVIDIA AGX. The NVIDIA AGX. Sizes and shapes of many different kinds. We have the NVIDIA AGX, high-speed CERTES, up to 320 tera operations, trillion operations of tensors, up to 25 teraflops of floating-point computation, CUDA computation, 16 gigarays per second, and I'll explain why that's so important in just a second, and it's starting at 15 watts. This little tiny computer, this little tiny computer, let me show you a couple of examples of them. This is the Xavier. 
this is the future brain of autonomous machines. It's the Xavier processor, 8,000 engineering years in the making. And in the future, I will have one right, right here to assist my intelligence. Okay, so this is the Xavier. And there are many versions of Xavier we could, of AGX we can create. And as a result, we could embed AI supercomputing into machines. You can have one, you could have one that's connected to, P this is an autonomous computer, completely self-contained computer. This is a PCI Express computer. So you have your embedded system, you wanna plug Xavier into it, it's really easy. High-speed IOs everywhere. If you have a car and you would like to have sensors, GMSL sensors and CAN bus connected to it, we have Xavier for, for uh, level two and level three cars. And then we have the large Pegasus, which takes multiple Xavier's, multiple Turing's, connect them all together into a supercomputer, and that's for robot taxis. We have all of these different, different types. The robotics loop, as I mentioned, the robotics loop, the autonomous machine loop, the processing loop starts from inferring the surrounding world into the robot, into the robot sensors, and we do sensor processing, mapping and localization, where am I, perception, what is around me, reason about the path and the task I will do, and try to understand the situation around me, the context, because it might affect what actions I take. And I need to do this with diversity and redundancy. And the reason for that is because where these machines affect lives, we simply cannot have one mode of failure. There cannot be a single mode failure. And so we have to have the ability to do things with multiple ways, and that's why we have PVA and DLA and Tensor Core. We could process different algorithms in different ways, we have so many certies, so we have sensor redundancy, and we have so much computing performance because all of those algorithms have to run redundantly and check each other. In the future, performance is directly related to safety. Safety equals performance because safety requires redundancy and diversity, whether it's an architecture of of very complicated systems or airplane, diversity and, com and uh, redundancy is vital to the architecture. And those systems are engineered into NVIDIA's processor Xavier, as well as the entire software stack that we create. And so this is the robotics loop. Sense the world, process through sensors, perception, reasoning, and action, and as quickly as possible, respond. As a result, it's comfortable, it interacts with you naturally, and it's safe. That is just a computer. The computer itself is only one of the three pillars of how future artificial intelligence systems will be developed. There are three other pillars. The three others are, one, you need to have an infrastructure and a very professional and rigorous flow to develop the artificial intelligence networks. Number two, we have to simulate everything. Simulation is the foundation of good engineering. And simulating artificial intelligence systems is vital to success. And then number three, the deployment, the deployment, the driving itself. So training neural networks, simulating the system, and driving the car, okay? So these three pillars are vital. I'm gonna show you our progress in simulations. The first simulation I'm gonna show you is this. As you know, one of the most important tests today in cars for the car industry is called NCAP. In order to achieve a safety rating, you have to go through certain tests. The benefit of having a simulator is we can take all of the, vir the tests and put it into virtual reality. And so the first demonstration we're gonna show you, and Mark Daly is gonna show it to us, is an end cap simulation of our driving stack 
trying to pass the test. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's go. Mark Daly. There we go. Hi, Jensen. Hey, Mark. So uh, real quickly, we, we actually modeled one of the test tracks that they do these NCAP test uh, trainings on. And uh, everything you're watching here, it, while it looks pretty real, this is all done in simulation. This is all being done in real time. The tests that we're watching here, we're watching various tests of, the, these are the car-to-car -car interactions on the NCAP uh, test. And track. this one this one is for uh, AEB testing. This is for AEB testing. So if you're looking uncomfortable. Emergency bre braking. Emergency braking. So we stop very, very late, but it, that's the nature of the test. Right. Okay. That's Go right. Ahead. And these are car-to-car -car interactions. In some cases, the, the uh, target car, we call it, is uh, moving much slower than the ego car, and yet we stop in time. And one of the benefits of, of a simulator, excuse me, Mark, one of yeah. the benefits of, a, benefits of a simulator is we could test it against cars that we rarely see, but cars that we really don't want to hit. <laughs> like, for example, that Ferrari, that La Ferrari. <laughs> And uh, another benefit of simulation, we can change weather conditions, we can change the time of day. Here we're running at night with just headlights to illuminate the, uh, the target car and see how our uh, autonomous driving performs. That's really fantastic. Do you have anything else? Uh, well, we do. Let's, uh, let's move from the NCAP uh, test and move over to localization. Oh, look at that. Hey, before you oh. start, look oh. at that just now. Oh, no, that's okay, that's okay. Sorry. We're able to avoid Real cars, as well as balloon cars. <laughs> I was so happy when we avoided the balloon because we tested our car on real cars. We've never tested on balloons. So the first time we tested on balloons, it worked. So, so clever. <laughs> you don't want to hit anything, even the Ferraris balloon Ferraris and balloons. That's right. <laughs> okay, well, let's switch real quick over to uh, another simulation that we've been working on. So this is, this is localization. This is the ability to determine where you are uh, within a centimeter or two of a map. This is critical if you're going to uh, drive autonomously and do any kind of path planning. Uh, today, we have things like GPS, but the, uh, the error on GPS can be meters, uh, several meters. Uh, we use something called localization uh, to allow us to uh, determine where the ego car is within a centimeter or two. Yeah, and so, so Mark, uh, the thing that's really, really important is, is we have to localize ourselves in many, many ways. The first way that we localize ourselves, of course, is using video odometry, just to make sure that wherever we were before, that, that the car knows uh, its, its movement and its trajectory and uh, velocity, okay? And so the relative relative uh, motion of the car is done through visual odometry. The second is by detecting the lanes, by detecting the lanes, even if you don't know where you are, you could detect the lanes and stay within it. And so using deep learning, we could recognize the roads and stay within it. Another way of doing localization. The third way of doing localization is to localize yourself within a map that was created in the past called a high definition map. The localization using cameras to a high definition map is really hard. And the reason for that is this. The car is pitching and rolling all over the place, number one. Number two, you have to take a three-dimensional information, three-dimensional data, and you have to register it, compare it to the two-dimensional image that you see in the, from the car. So this two-dimensional to three-dimensional reg transformation and registration is computationally intensive. Well, two dimension, three dimension to two dimension, two dimension to three dimension transformation and registration is something that computer graphics is really, really good at. And so as a result, visual localization using our GPU is fantastically accurate and fast. And so what we're doing here is Mark is localizing within that HD map, and our car is driving. And it's detecting the lanes, it's detecting the cars, and avoiding the cars, and it's driving along. Really fantastic. Mark awesome. Daly, thank you very much. And all of this, all of this, this simulation environment is running hardware in the loop. What is happening is this. Hey, can you guys turn on this light right here? This machine, if you have time later, this machine right here, this machine right here, this is the image generator on top. This right here is generating that camera. This is creating the virtual world for all of the sensors around the car. This box here 
has the drive computer inside. This box has the drive computer and the drive computer software. The engineers at NVIDIA, when they're coding and developing software, there's this computer, many of them sitting in the data center. And whenever they're ready to test their software, they throw it into here. And they run that software like a video game. And they sit in their, sit in their office or anywhere they like. As a result, they don't have to go down to the car and test every piece of software. This continuous integration process allows our software engineers tremendous productivity. But they have to know that the binary is identical, that the software stack is identical, that they don't have to change anything, that it's real. If they don't trust the simulation environment, they will not use it. And so this simulation environment has to behave just like the real world. The vehicle dynamics, the vehicle dynamics is integrated with a company called IPG. And we create these worlds. We integrate with the map that, is, that comes from uh, companies like Zenren or TomTom Tom or, or uh, Baidu in China or, or here. And these, these high definition maps are connected to the server. And this server is essentially a car, a virtual car in a virtual world. And software development could be incredibly fast. That's what's actually running. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Mark. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let me show you um, all of that, but on the road. And uh, this, this, uh, these, some of these videos are really fun. Uh, this one, this one's right here in Tokyo. We have the ability to lane, we can, we can merge into traffic, we can change lanes, get on the ramp, off the ramp. This is what the computer car sees, the AI, AI car sees. This is in California. That Sang Moon, one of our engineers, fantastic. We detect the current ego lane, we detect the next, the adjacent lanes. We're just making incredibly fast progress now. This entire platform is open, so all of our partners could use pieces or all of the software. Sangmin is now taking the off-ramp from 280 back towards 92 towards 101. There goes the off-ramp. It's detecting everything. The path planning has multiple, multiple different ways, and we choose the best one all the time dynamically. This is in uh, suburban areas. We have the ability to recognize situations. Detecting intersections is really, really hard, and detecting lights is hard. And so we can now detect intersections of all kinds and detect lights. We have the ability to detect intersections of all kinds. As you know, when you're driving, sometimes the intersections, it's very obvious to us that it's an intersection but it's not so clear to the computer, and it's not so clear to the HD map. And maybe the HD map hasn't even been there before. When we come towards an intersection that looks like an intersection, we teach the computers how to recognize all of these subtle cues that we learned over the years to be intersections. And as a result, we have an artificial intelligence that's called WaitNet. WaitNet says you're about to come into an area that is uncertain, and maybe you should slow down or come to a stop. And of course, stop light, stop signs, a perfect example. These are called California stops.
And that is a legal stop. <laughs> okay, so drive AV. I'm s yep. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so proud of all the partners that we're working with here in Japan. And there's the most famous of the autonomous transportation projects here in Japan. Uh, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, we announced that we're partnering with Toyota to develop AV technology. And I'm so proud to say that we'll be in production in the year 2020. And so we have much work to do, but we're on our path to putting Drive Xavier on the road. We're working with Tier 4 on last mile delivery. As you know, home delivery is the latest craze. I was trying to deliver something to my hotel room the other day. Apparently, apparently DoorDash doesn't work that well and Uber Eats doesn't work that well here in Japan yet. However, in the United States, you don't ever have to leave your house. You don't ever have to leave your pajamas. You can just pull your phone, you can eat whatever you want and buy whatever you want and people deliver it to your house. In the future, of course, it is impossible to sustain an entire society that wants everything delivered wherever they are, whenever they want it. And so working on the last mile, that last mile of autonomous driving is really vital to the, infra to the future of our infrastructure. Uh, ZMP, robot taxis. As we know, the world travels 10 trillion miles per year. 10 trillion miles per year. If every single mile cost $3, 10 trillion, that's a $300 trillion industry. With robot taxis, we could make that transportation a lot cheaper. Um, we would still have lots of taxis all over the place. It's still great to have somebody who can find these very complicated roads here in Japan, as you know, that is not very well mapped. It will be decades before robot taxis can handle that. However, there are many areas where it's very easy, relatively safe, and relatively simple for robot taxis to be able to execute. ZMP is working on robot taxis. Isuzu trucks. There's not enough truck driver in the world. This is a crisis, not, here, not just here in Japan, but it's a crisis everywhere in the world. I read somewhere that we are short of about 50% truck drivers. And the reason, of course, is because we're now buying goods from all over the world and we're shipping it all over the country. Isuzu can now work with us to build self-driving trucks for the long haul, and it takes some pressure off of the truck drivers, makes it a little bit more relaxing, safer. We're working with companies all over the world now. From Toyota, we announced Mercedes-Benz working with us on, on, uh, on um, uh, building their robot taxis. We're working with Volvo, Subaru, all of these mobility service companies working with Uber, Tier 4, Zooks in California, Neuro, ZMP, Zenuity, Aurora, a great startup, Ascent, the trucking companies, Isuzu I mentioned, Volvo, one of the world's largest trucking companies, the Tier 1s that we're working with, Denso here in Japan, Bosch, Continental, ZF, and the mapping companies all over the world and sensor companies all over the world. The reason why they work with us is because NVIDIA's system is the only self-driving car system that is open, it is programmable, and it's rich with software so that they can take advantage of all the different pieces of it that they need or want. It is a completely open computing platform. I am super excited today to tell you that after several years of working on our autonomous driving computer, the Drive AGX Xavier development system is now available to order. Isn't that beautiful? A brown box. You just have to get one of these computers, plug it into your car, and you can develop autonomous vehicles. It's architected for safety from 30 tops to 320 trillion operations per second. It runs our soft drive software 1.0. So all of the software I've been demonstrating to you, we're building 1.0, putting it together, and it will be available for OTA. And so once you connect up to our cloud, whenever you're ready, we could OTA new software to you. And so from this point forward, the rate of progress for the autonomous vehicle industry will be just turbocharged because we now all have a production 
system that we can develop on and rich software that we could accelerate our development. It's OTA ready. It's available on October 1st, so come and order it. This is what it looks like. About the size of a shoebox. It's translucent in here, but this is what it looks like. It's like, like, a, sh like a pair of shoes, just heavier. When I applied for this job, they didn't say that it was so physical. They didn't say, so <laughs> that was close. Is this the only one we have? One billion dollars, here we go. Drive AGX Xavier, ready for order, delivery October 1st. There's another type of robot I want to show you. The drive, a, the drive computer autonomous vehicle has rules that they follow. And other cars are following rules as well. Although you're traveling extremely fast, the rules are relatively straightforward. And it's designed for outside. There's another type of computer we want to, another type of robot we like to build, and it's for inside. Inside, the world is very unstructured. People are all around you. Every single environment is different. You're moving slowly, but your interaction with the people around you needs to be much more engaging. You have to be able to interact with the people around you so that they could tell you what it is that they need. You have to avoid them. You have to understand where you are. And so the robot loop is still the same. Sensing, perception, reasoning, and planning. However, the need for contextual awareness is much, much higher. And as a result, the computation requirement is just as high as self-driving cars, but in a very different nature. We call this platform the Isaac SDK, the Isaac Robotics Platform. It runs on the same Xavier. It runs on the same Xavier. The entire software stack is different because the algorithms necessary to perform this robotics activity is very different. And so let me show it to you. This is our Isaac SDK running on our reference robot we call Carter. Our reference car is called BB-8. This is called Carter. The two computers are the same. It's the AGX. The software stack was Drive, and it is Isaac here. Let's show it to him. This side is real, and that side is a virtual reality simulator. Could you imagine a robot going into an elevator and coming out in a completely different map in a different world? This is the NVIDIA headquarters. And that's the conference room I sit in. And that's my lunch. <laughs> that's so amazing. So just imagine this little tiny robot is navigating around all of this really complex. There are no road signs. So it's got to figure out where it is and where it needs to go based on a larger plan. And it tries to, tries to plan the trajectory around obstacles. And the obstacles are changing all the time. It's changing all the time. The environment's changing all the time. And ideally, this robot will be able to interact with you, talk with you, recognize you, and um, take actions from us. Uh, Claire is going to show us a demo uh, of the simulator. And the reason why this is so important, as you can imagine, it is almost impossible 
to train Carter and Isaac of all of the different scenarios that will happen. And you don't want to put this robot in the real world as it's trying to learn it. And so we want to create a virtual world, a virtual world where the robot can learn how to be a robot. And in this virtual world, it has to obey the laws of physics. It has to be physically real so that when you're done, the software from this simulation brain can be downloaded right into the real robot and things just work exactly as you expect. And so the simulator, the simulator and all of the algorithms, of course, of robotics is vitally important. And so just as previously I showed you, Drive was simulating the world and running hardware in the loop. We do the same with Carter. Simulate the world and run hardware in the loop so that the software is exactly as it would be when you're done. Claire is going to give us a demonstration. All right, so um, the reason why we are, are um, we're going to show you a little bit more um, of, of what you've seen on, in the video is, is because, as Jensen explained, it's, it's very hard to develop robots, and it takes a lot of time. And uh, with simulation we, and, and, and with, with the development tools that we can see on the left over there, we um, allow you to accelerate the development cycle. So this is the map. This is the map of, of Endeavor. And uh, Claire and the software team, uh, Claire is the head of our robotics, robotics uh, effort. And she has, the first thing it has to do is Carter has to localize itself within that map. And this is trajectory planning. Red is long-term tra long tra trajectory plan, the path plan, the route plan. And the blue is the near-term trajectory plan out of the algorithm LRQ. And this is the brain, this is the eyes of Carter. This is what Carter sees. This is what our robot sees. And what it sees, of course, is a simulation world. And so Claire is going to take it away. And um, um, so let's go ahead. So the demo application that runs here on the left is really the one who executed the pass in the video before. And um, there is literally zero changes between um, the running simulation and the running reality. However, what's um, very interesting when you when you start playing uh, with with simulation and you have this ability to create um, and generate um, complicated scenario or look, look at this create re replanned create ahead, yes to create dynamically um, uh, obstacles or objects. Um, then the, the, the testing of the robot become a game, uh, which is an extremely important um, aspect when you know that um, everything that a robot um, needs to do requires extensive testing, like months, years of testing. And with simulation, it becomes a game, and it, become, it becomes uh, uh, a fun exercise. So you can see here um, that, um, I mean, everything is completely dynamic. Um, the global planning is uh, is basically giving the overall trajectory, and the and the and, and the local plan planner LQR is in charge of avoiding obstacles. And so there is no guarantee that we, if we were, were about to run it again, that it would it would follow the same route because um, uh, the simulation in is intrinsically also random, and the objects um, that we are spanning out in front of Carter are changing the environment. That's really terrific. Thank you, Claire. Good job. The Isaac SDK comes with a whole bunch of really, really sophisticated software. There's a globalization, a global, global localization um, algorithm that's based on GPUs. If a map editor that allows you to decide and tell Isaac where are the areas that are maybe to avoid or in points of interest or, or um, uh, you know, destinations, uh, there is a, a linear quadratic reactor pl path planner that uh, she was showing you just a second ago, visual odometry, knowing where the robot is and how its motion is, the ability to use deep learning, artificial intelligence, to use simple cameras to perceive depth. Very different than, than um, uh, cars that, that look down the road and, and in some amount of distance, a robot has to see the depth of everything near it. A physics simulator, so that if you were using a particular simulator, um, you could apply the laws of physics to it. We do human pose estimation, 
which is really important so that you could learn the context of the environment. We have to not only recognize the pose, but also the motion of the pose so that we can understand gestures. We recognize objects and people. And we also do speech recognition. Hey, Carter, bring me a coffee. Bring me a coffee. Oh, no. Carter, bring me a sandwich. Bring me a sandwich. Hey, Carter, look. Hi there. <laughs> so speech recognition, of course, is very important. And the ability to take commands and chain it with actual robotics actions is very important. Isaac, Xavier, uh, we've been briefing early adopters and developers and giving them development kits for some time. And I'm just so excited with the enthusiasm that the industry has. The first chapter of artificial intelligence was developing the AI computer, DGX, the Tensor Core GPUs. The second chapter of artificial intelligence is AI in the internet. The third chapter of artificial intelligence, and I believe the largest chapter of all, is AI for industries. There are so many large industries where automation can boost productivity, where automation can make the tasks safer, make the tasks more effective and more productive. And so I'm very, very happy to see the, um, the adoption of Xavier in our development kits and our platform all over the world. One of the most exciting is our partnership with Yamaha. CEO Hidaka-san has announced that Yamaha will standardize on Xavier. For all, they are the largest mobility machines company in the world. And because all of these mobility machines needs to be more automatic, safer, more aware, finally with Xavier and our SDK and our acceleration software, they could create intelligent mobile machines. Intelligent mobile machines. So I'm very, very pleased and very proud that Yamaha is standardizing on NVIDIA's AGX architecture. Thank you. There are so many industries and so many applications, from construction to factory automation to Yamaha's intelligent mobile machines, Canon's AOIT, automatic optical inspection, to be able to perform optical inspection, visual inspection at superhuman levels, facial recognition, Masashi and their factory automation, Kawada Technologies, robotics, collaborative robots, and Fanuc, the world's largest manufacturing robots company, all developing on the NVIDIA AGX platform. I'm super excited about that. And look at all of the different, look at all of the different industries that will take advantage of robotics technology and automation in the future. Thank you very much for your partnership. There's one industry that is in the process of being revolutionized that's incredibly important. It's a $100 billion Im imaging industry, medical imaging industry, which, of course, here in Japan, there are some giants. The fundamental processing pipeline of medical instruments is sensing image reconstruction to reconstruct images that you cannot see with your eyes and only possible with all the different sensors, whether it's x-ray or ultrasound or, or mag magnetic resonance. There's a box that it can't do today, and then it visualizes it and shows you what your eyes cannot see. From tens of gigabytes of bandwidth to teraflops of performance, this is what it takes to build today's medical instruments. All of these instruments that I show you has NVIDIA CUDA inside. From 1 to 12 GPUs. From 5 to 50 tops of computational performance. The amount of computation necessary for today's medical imaging systems is really amazing. It's built basically like this. There's an FPGA front end, there's a CPU to run the host, and a bunch of GPUs to do the image reconstruction. What we're going to do in the future is to replace it with one Xavier. For many of the instruments, we can now replace and integrate all of the FPGA CERTES into the Xavier chip to do all of the sensor processing and image reconstruction that already runs on CUDA on the Xavier chip. And for the very first time, we could apply 
30 teraops of AI processing to image recognition so that it can do automatic detection right there, right there in situ, or it could do segmentation to reveal and help you see the fuzzy images better. Okay? And then, of course, visualization all on one chip. If you want more performance, we could have a scalable version of it. This, is, this line is called the Clara AGX. The Clara AGX. One Xavier replacing multiple chips, and the software is compatible with all the software that's being developed today in all these medical instruments. Today, we're announcing the availability, the open availability of the Jetson AGX. It's an embedded, embedded AI computer for edge development, edge computer development. It basically looks like this. This is as big as it is. And I want to show you, give me, give me, uh, give me the quadro garden. This is really amazing. So this is the Jetson AGX Xavier dev kit. Okay, this little tiny computer, 30 trillion operations per second. This one little chip runs anywhere from 15 watts or so to 30 watts, replaces essentially a workstation, and does AI faster than anything on the edge, anything on autonomous machines today. And if you would like, during your development, you could also plug in a NVIDIA graphics card, just like that. Just like that, okay? Pretty amazing, right? Okay? And so as a development kit, it's easy to use. And it comes with world-class Linux capability and two acceleration stacks. The Jetson acceleration stack for you to write your own software or the Isaac Robotics SDK for you to build robots. That's it. We made several announcements today, but these are all of the new NVIDIA platforms. It's amazing how many new things that we have just announced. The Quadro RTX is going into production, ramping production now. The GeForce RTX is ramping production now. The RTX is going to reinvent computer graphics, the world's first hybrid computer graphics system that includes rasterization, ray tracing, and deep learning fused into one. We announced the Tesla P4. This little tiny computer, it's so small I could keep it in my pocket. The Tesla T4 computer, little processor, universal inference accelerator, the world's first that can perform at this level, incredible levels, hybrid and uh, mixed precision. We also have the software stack that includes Kubernetes on NVIDIA, Docker on NVIDIA, and now the inference serving engine container that makes it possible for us to maximize the throughput as well as the utilization of a hyperscale data center. We announced a brand new NVIDIA AGX line and all of the partners here in Japan that are working with us in all these different industries, whether it's the automotive industry, the manufacturing industry, and the healthcare industry. And then lastly, those dev kits are available for you to try right away. Not only does it come with a great computer, it comes with a fantastic acceleration stack. This acceleration stack allows you to create your own software or to take pieces of our software and turn it into an amazing application. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a great pleasure to be here with you today. And so with that, I want to thank all of you for coming to GTC. Have a great GTC.